Hi, so you will have read the poem uh, in Mrs Tilcher's class twice now and you will have a really good idea of what the, um, the topic of each stanza is and what the focus of each stanza is and then the narrative of each of those as you go through with your notes so far. What I want to look at right now is um, our learning objective. I'm just going to go back to that. Explore how a poet contrasts the wonder and confusion of a child at school so that you should have noticed that within the structure of this um, there is a real contrast between the beginning and the end. Um, and then also thinking about how we can use our volatile, uh, sorry, our versatile vocabulary. So we have volatile and constant, which we've learned about today. And then also we've got these bank of other brilliant words, tangible, intangible, permanent, ephemeral, order and chaos that we're going to bring into this. And as you all see, these words, as we go through these poems, you can start applying them in lots of different ways and you're going to sound really, really smart as you do it. So the first thing that I want to look at is, is who is the speaker? of this poem okay so what I want you to note down is who you think the speaker is okay then I want you to think about the tone okay so is, is the tone um, angry and bitter or is it something else okay I want you to give two separate ideas for tone here and then as an extension, you might remember one of the words that we started learning. And it goes N-O. Mm. Okay, make sure you've got that one. Now, I then want to just think about how the tone shifts. Okay, so I'm thinking about the tone at the start it might be like this. And then the tone shifts at the end to be what? How does that tone shift? What is the turn or the change? Okay. Once you've got that clear, you can start thinking. We can start exploring our quotes in a bit more detail. Um, we're going to have a look at those quotes that really underline that shift in tone. So the first one is you could travel up the Blue Nile. So get that down into your books. Okay. Now, my first question is, can you really travel up the Blue Nile uh, in a classroom? The answer is no. So is that a simile? or a metaphor, okay, is that a simile or a metaphor? Once you've decided you know the right answer, which is that it is a metaphor, what I want you to think is what does that metaphor show about her classroom? So that metaphor reveals what two things about Mrs. Tilcher's classroom, if you almost feel like you could travel up the Blue Nile there. Okay. Then I want to focus on two more bits. This verb here, to travel. That reveals that Mrs. Tilcher's classroom gave the kids a sense of what? Give me two things that it gives us a sense of. And then obviously we have this particular place here, the Blue Nile, which is in Egypt. It's one of the longest rivers in the world. And it's on the continent of Africa. Okay, now what does this example of this going up the Blue Nile suggests to us, okay? So we've got this idea that the metaphor you could travel up the Blue Nile reveals two things. Specifically, the verb travel creates a sense of what? But why the Blue Nile? Is that a normal everyday thing? Okay, is it something that is mundane and boring? Or is it something that is exotic? 
and different. Give me two things. Okay, so this is the beginning. Okay, we have this quite nostalgic tone where anything seems possible. And I love this other sort of extension quote we have here. I've got this idea of uh, a window opened. Okay, we have this window opening out into the world. You can see the world outside. What could that suggest that her classroom created? What can you, number one, what can you see through a window? What does a window allow you to do? And what would happen if you climbed through? Okay, and that will lead you back to here. So you might be thinking a window opened. Well, I can see through the window, a window to the world. But then listen, we have this verb here, it opened. It allows you to smell the things, to hear the sounds of this world outside, but maybe even to climb through it and to find out what the world is really like. So it's a place of wonder, it's a place of joy. And that is revealed in the next quotation that I want to look at. Um, and that is, the classroom glowed like a sweet shop. Okay, first thing, I want you to tell me the device. Okay, what is that? Is that personification? Uh, is it sibilance or is it something else? Tell me it and tell me it accurately. Good. So what I want you to think of now is think about the whole quote together. It glowed like a sweet shop. Okay. How do you feel if you're a child and you go into a sweet shop? Give me two things that you feel when you go into a sweet shop as a child. And I wouldn't worry too much about your teeth here. Okay, then we have this, going back here, we have this sweet shop and then we have this idea that this, it glowed. Okay, so we know that this is a verb and if something... Sorry, if something glows, it, it does what? Give me two things. Okay, now, what is it that's being described as a sweet shop that glows? This is the really key thing, is because it's the classroom that is being described as the glowing sweet shop. Okay, it's this thing here. It's the classroom, I guess, that is the tasty sweet shop, full of treats and full of all of that excitement. Now, That would suggest then that Mrs. T's classroom is a constant source of what? Two things. Constant source of what? And then once you've got that this then tells us that it is nostalgic because 
and then give me two reasons why this is nostalgic. Now, if you were looking closely, there's this strange quote hidden in here. And it talks about Brady and Hindley. So if we're thinking about a little extension, we've got Brady and Hindley faded. So if you don't know, they were murderers and they murdered children and young adults. Now, there's this kind of background shift, right? The child has worries. So this suggests that there is a sense of what here? Security or vulnerability in the background? Moral or immoral in the background? Okay. And that reveals that this world is it as safe as Mrs. Tilcher's classroom? Is the outside safe? Okay, what about inside? What does that show us? The difference between outside and inside. Now, that's just a little hint to this change of tone. And it carries on from stanza three into stanza four. We have this idea that it's now Easter. And typically Easter is linked to spring, which is linked to what type of things? Well, we know that animals are born then and what not. So that might help us get onto that okay but also sign the sense of growing up now we've got this other this real development here we see this twist in the tone and we've got the quote you kicked him but stared at your parents appalled. Now this is a really interesting little quote because what is it that that boy told her? Why does she kick the boy? Okay, She kicks the boy for what reason? What does he tell her? that she probably didn't know about before. What grown-up process. Okay. And then maybe from there, is she... What, yeah, how does that change her? Give me two ways that might change her. What does she now know that she can't not know? And what? What part of her life could that symbolise? Now, even though she kicked the boy, okay, we get this idea that she stared at her parents appalled. Now, if, for example, you were appalled, how do you, how do you feel? Okay. So how does she feel then about her parents? And then what might that do to the way she sees the rest of her life? How might that 
create a sense of create a sense of chaos because and a loss of innocence because so we have this big shift here in that she grows up and she learns about sex so and i think that's really important you have this innocence of childhood this glowing sweet shop inside the classroom but these things happen outside the classroom so we have this sense of outside class is the what world the, the world of the child the protected world the secure world or something else so this world outside the classroom is what versus inside the class at the start which was what two things and we've set you up brilliantly with your versatile vocabulary because you should be able to smash that okay so there paragraph three she's kind of learning about these things growing up sex relationships that she finds to, she finds that she is appalled by she's even appalled to look at her parents who she trusted to begin with and she felt didn't do that kind of thing but now things are different and i wonder how this then changes um the last paragraph this paragraph stanza get it right okay the last line that i want to look at is that feverish july the air tasted of electricity and I want to have a look at this one here this quote this adjective here feverish okay if you have a fever you are Give me two things. Okay, which shows that they felt what? Give me two more things. Okay. Then we have this idea of this taste of electricity. And that's a really interesting metaphor. Electricity is what? Give me two things. And they could taste these things coming. This foreshadows what? And this change is intangible because now finally we have this lovely little extension one we have split sky open into a thunderstorm I'm going to ask you some really short questions about that but this is nice this idea of the split sky what two things did this show us about growing up one and two And then we've got this idea of the thunderstorm. Okay, now list me three pieces of versatile vocabulary that link to the thunderstorm.
Now, we've got this idea that childhood innocence now is ephemeral. And we'll have a look at that in the next lesson. Great job. Follow the next instruction from your teacher.